welcome everybody to this session. This is going to be uh, a fire chat discussion. Mm -hmm. So basically, you you two are going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a great honor to have you both here. Uh, George, uh, he's an IT expert. He's leading innovation in the banking sector currently. But he also is a BOD member of the Hellenic Association of Blockchain. So he's a technical expert in the area. And he's uh, uh, merging with the banking uh, and uh, consequently with our profession. Sandra, he, she's a global leader. She's advocating blockchain around the world, literally. Uh, she's giving speeches and coordinating actions uh, in all uh, aspects of uh, activity. And we are, we are everybody, we are very happy to have you here, both. Thank you. So let's uh, talk about what is blockchain, George, if you may say. OK. First of all, thank you. And uh, I would like to take uh, the opportunity to uh, thank personally Mariana, Nikos, uh, Hellenic Association of Treasury, and such an honor to be speaking with uh, Sandra here. Uh, may I have uh, the clicker so that we change slides? Thank you. Okay, we could talk for hours about this, especially me and Sandra, but uh, we'll try to be quick. Um, so, hi a short history of uh, blockchain, okay. Uh, some people think that this is a new technology, but actually it's not. Uh, it started from 1991 when uh, scientists, uh, Hubbard and Stornetta, decided to create a tamper-proof uh, document management system, solve the double cash spending um, problem. And, uh, you know, with the mortgage crisis in the U.S. and the fall of uh, Lehman Brothers, uh, there was this paper of uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, the Bitcoin. It didn't say anything about uh, blockchain inside, but uh, everybody understood uh, uh, what it was. And after that, uh, we proceeded to the expansion of uh, uh, platforms and uh, Ethereum came where uh, blockchain became pro programmable. We had the smart contracts where uh, we could uh, have uh, specific uh, actions under specific actions, and we'll see the interoperability uh, later on. And uh, I would say now uh, many banks and uh, uh, companies, technology companies, are trying to experiment. When uh, we'll go to the future, maturity says that it is uh, in 2025, where this could be pervasive and uh, global. Um, actually, for me, uh, as a technologist, I would say that uh, it is the convergence of uh, cryptography, asymmetric cryptography, distribution, uh, uh, network distribution, computing. Uh, so it's uh, a little bit of everything. And why now, somebody would say, because uh, technology allows it now. Um, this is uh, also, uh, let's talk about uh, the blockchain evolution. Uh, my depiction of uh, what blockchain would look like. And uh, we discussed about uh, Bitcoin, we discussed about uh, the introduction of proof of work and uh, the cryptographic algorithms. Uh, we saw the, the introduction of Ethereum. And uh, we are heading, uh, we are there, and uh, blockchain 4, as I have put the number. And uh, we are heading on the IoT integration uh, like uh, Thanos uh, spoke uh, previously, where uh, transactions will happen between devices and we have uh, a massive interoperability. So I will uh, pass on to, to Sandra for the next slide. If you share your point of view regarding the technology, I, don't, I know you don't want to get too deep inside technology. Okay, but there are a lot of buzzwords around blockchain. Yeah. And could you defog a bit? So if anyone asks me, why can't I just use a database? Why the heck do we have to use this blockchain thing? I actually have this answer, which evolves over time. But this is my answer right now. You can use a database. Databases are great. They store information. Fantastic. They've been around for decades now. 
They're very useful. But here's the issue. Databases are very limited in what they can do. They are storers of information. It goes in, and if you want it to, it goes out. A blockchain layer, infrastructure layer, is what I would call the next generation in risk mitigation and risk management. And people always say, what are you talking about? What do you mean? It's a risk management tool. All I hear about is crypto and all the scams. So put that aside for one second. The reason why I say blockchain infrastructure is actually very important, particularly to financial services, is because it is actually the ultimate risk management risk uh, mitigation tool. Why? Because you can, with a bit blockchain infrastructure, share across multiple parties information that, when siloed in a database, is actually very difficult to port across in real time. So imagine a secure layer that allows you to talk and share different pieces of information at any given time. And everyone, if they're allowed, again, the rules of the road in blockchain are the most important. If I give full access to Nikos, but you know, maybe I don't trust George so much, so I give him only partial access, then that operates in this system. And I've given certain rules to George, certain rules to Nikos, and maybe they don't trust me at all, uh, hopefully not, I mean, hopefully they do, but if they don't, then maybe they give me very little access other than just reading certain pieces. The point being is, it allows for a global collaboration that really was not possible, but this technology now allows it from an encrypted standpoint. So to me, the built-in audit function, the built-in transparency around who can see and share this information, it's once verified, it is locked in. It is hard to, as you know, a lot of people say, it's hard to cook the books afterwards. That to me alone, if I were an insurance company, if I'm an auditor, if I'm a regulator, I should be very excited about this technology. You said the uh, buzzword, uh, something like permission, I guess, mm. right? Mm. Why this word is so important in the blockchain technology? Permission versus completely open. So that's a big debate. Public chains versus private permission chains. Financial services, and I'm a former banker, so, um, you know, when we first started talking about this, it all started as permissioned private. I only want to invite people I trust already. Okay, that's interesting. And now you've got this slide here. And by the way, we're going to share the entire deck of this uh, project. Much appreciated. Yeah, because I think it's actually very important for all of you to look at this deck. There was a survey done uh, very recently, a few months ago, and it's the um, ESA, the In International Security Services Association, put this together, and we work very closely with them. And they interviewed basically a whole range of financial services firms from asset managers all the way through to banks and uh, custodians. And what was interesting here is there's an evolution happening. It is not just private permission blockchains anymore, though most of the world sits there today in financial services. Why? Because you have to have confidentiality. You don't want all your data out there. You don't want your customer's data out there. That makes perfect sense, completely understood. And you also want to trust the people you are already working with. However, in an evolution state, eventually there are going to be bridges across private and public chains. And we are just beginning to see some major institutions looking at solutions that actually work in a public chain world. And you might say, why? Why would you do that? Uh, those are all already being looked at for tokenization. That's, I think, going to be one of the first out the gate to actually scale because you've already had a few banks go and try it out and test it. Uh, SDX through um, Swiss uh, Six Exchange uh, Six uh, did their uh, half hybrid, half digital bond, half regular bond. And that was last year. And that was very interesting. And again, you're seeing these in like a couple hundred million increments. Eventually, I think we're going to see billion dollar, multi-billion dollar bond issuances. The other interesting thing is if anyone's looking at green bonds, green bonds being tokenized is actually coming up in discussion even more. And that to me is, is another, going to be another big interesting area. Um, equities, absolutely. People talk about digitizing the, um, what are those called, the corporate notices. Uh, because every time there's a stock split or some sort of thing happens to the stocks, 
record keeping, you would think would keep records well. Maybe most of the time it does, but sometimes things get lost in translation or it's not as well kept as it should be, or frankly, there are a lot of intermediaries in that process. So there's discussions around actually streamlining the entire corporate action, corporate notification process, which by the way, customers love because if it can be streamlined, it's much better for the asset manager or the pension fund manager um, to be able to manage. So these are things that I think are quite interesting. We have uh, George, would you like to take on this question also? Yes, uh, um, just uh, a small addition that uh, of course what the treasurer wants, uh, I will take a wild guess, I'm not a treasurer, but uh, he, he needs to keep up uh, with uh, the cash flow, he needs uh, to get the settlement right uh, in time with low costs. He may be uh, a global treasurer, may be uh, in charge of uh, many legal entities across uh, uh, countries, and uh, he needs to make the settlement uh, fast and also to, to get money. Uh, maybe in the near future, he would be able to use these financial instruments on uh, blockchain to, to issue corporate bonds to get money uh, for the company. So, more or less, uh, I think uh, it is very positive for someone to explore and see uh, such technologies. Yes, and uh, the other big uh, era that uh, has a lot to contribute is, uh, I think, is payments, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, do we have uh, another slide? Because I wanted to show the difference. Yes, okay. Yes. Uh, this is not completely, but it's uh, the general idea, okay? Uh, correspondent banking, okay? And I think one of the major um, uh, benefits of uh, blockchain and uh, CBDCs and uh, stable coins and uh, whatever instruments they use to, to make payments uh, is because uh, of cr cross-border payments, okay? Now, uh, it is the transactions to do, uh, to send money to another bank in another continent, it's uh, very slow, uh, there's no transparency, you do not have any control, slow, three to five days, and expensive, okay? Imagine that you, you're doing this all the time, and if we move on to the, not uh, at all, um, because I have heard some um, examples where uh, the transactions uh, sent, for example, to Latin America are very fast, but uh, the, the, the case the is that yes. there are delays. And uh, this, uh, the source is from uh, World Economic Forum. Uh, that, what does it show? Uh, we discussed about KYC, so imagine that we previously have uh, submitted our details on a digital identity blockchain, so the bank knows who is sending the money. Um, after that, immediately, there is a smart contract handling the, the transaction, the forex uh, exchange rates, because I would like to send the money when dollar is at that stage, for example. Uh, I send it to the correspondent bank under a distributed shared ledger, and uh, when uh, the beneficiary gets the money, I know that he took it. And uh, more, uh, what happens is that uh, the regulatory reports are automatically generated, and of course the cost of the transaction is much more less than uh, the, the previous transaction. So this is just uh, as a general idea where we're, we're heading, okay? So you think that uh, now, I, I guess that the, the, average, the cost of the payment uh, sector globally it's something like 0.5 or 1% uh, of global GDP. So this will be affected dramatically if blockchain is adopted, right? Could it be the case? I think there's two possible outcomes, one more sure than the other. Blockchain, whether institutions use them or not, have already forced a competitive rethinking of existing systems. So meaning, I don't know how many remember, Facebook Libra was announced and all the governments freaked out. Well, actually they had a good reason for freaking out. Do you know why? Facebook has, now Meta, I know, 2.3 billion users, supposedly, in their network. That's bigger than every, any sovereign nation. If they issue a, a stable coin or their own token, and let's say there's even just 10% take up, 
That is bigger than most nations, populations of nations. That is scary from a sovereign standpoint when you think about if they had a wallet, their own currency, and then even 10% of that population started using it. And what the implications are for monetary policy and sovereign control over monetary policy. So rightfully so, they freaked out. But what happened then, it triggered central bank digital currency innovation. People have been looking at it for a long time, but all of a sudden, that event alone spurred the next 18 months of now 90 plus central bank innovation projects around CBDC. Now, okay, some of them are just researching, but you'd be surprised if you look at, um, I think the Atlantic Council and the World Economic Forum have very good data on this. There is a map that the Atlantic Council has come with, it's a heat map of who is doing what in central bank digital currencies is very interesting. Take a look, you'd be surprised by how many are actually advancing and some have actually launched. So, forcing competition, also similar for financial institutions and it will impact obviously corporate treasurers in the end. The other one is if it does get adopted as infrastructure, I think there is a benefit to this because just look at this um, process. If it's all using the same underlying layer, think about how much faster you can then verify someone, get the payment flows, probably cut out a bunch of intermediaries, and then also secure that data so that it'd be very hard to manipulate. Audit, payments, verification, rolled into one. I don't know, if we can make it work, I think it sounds pretty great. Excellent, thank you very much. Well, so going back to the CBDC, what do you think is the best outcome, the best possible outcome from this story? Oh, CBDC, we could talk for another hour. So there's <laughs> retail CBDC and, and wholesale banking CBDC. The reality is most developed countries don't need both or maybe they don't even need either. I, I actually am very critical of asking the question to governments, what are you doing with your digital currency? Like, what's the purpose? Are you benefiting your citizens? Or is it to benefit the current banking system because it's not as efficient as it could be? I really have to ask that question. So there's an example in the US right now. Uh, Fed now is gonna be implemented. It is a faster payment solution for SMEs and for banks. That's great. It has nothing to do with CBDC. It has nothing to do with, but it's faster rails or blockchain. It is faster rails. That's good. To me, what's more important is the outcome, not necessarily that you're using a blockchain. And to me, if blockchain can spur others to innovate more and be lower cost, then great, whether you're using blockchain or not. So the question is, uh, what's the difference between digital currency and uh, digital money and CBDC, right? And if there's a purpose. Okay. Please. Okay, I, I'll like try to, to, to make the separation because, you know, CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency, okay? Digital Euro Project, Digital Currency. It's a CBDC from the European Central Bank. Okay, it's a much more larger. But uh, we can see that the central banks across Europe, and I will take an example, Bank of France, they made a project. Yes. Uh, it's, it's one of them. They may have CBDCs uh, created in different platforms, Quorum, Ethereum, um, Hyperledger fabric, you, you don't uh, know. Uh, what you know is that they have the, the need to, to, to create a CBDC, okay. And uh, they managed to send money from uh, um, a Swiss bank uh, to France and, uh, and back. And what else is happening? There is another, be before of the wholesale uh, CBDCs, uh, there was a concern. What about the retail banks? Is uh, central banks are going to take uh, charge? No, Fabio Panetta from the central bank uh, came out and said that, uh, don't worry, uh, we don't have the power to, to support the KYC procedure and all the other infrastructure. Retail banks will do that, but of course, nothing is yet finalized. And uh, there is another idea, the MCBDC, the multiple CBDCs, where uh, a CBDC from China, for example, could uh, settle with uh, a USD CBDC, European CBDC, nobody knows, but what we know is the cross-border functionality and uh, the, the future idea that it is uh, the payments and financial inclusion, if you want. So, summing up, 
the technology is here. Mm. Everybody is uh, having an eye for it, even the public sector, the private sector. And uh, let could you share uh, one real time, real life case that you came across uh, to see the the pros and cons of this? Yeah. Uh, so I'll give a CBDC example just because we were just yes, talking excellent. about it. Project Bacon is the National Bank of Cambodia. It started a number of years ago. It's very interesting what's happened with Project Bacon. So the demographics, very young population. Uh, they were actually trying to encourage, and they all use phones, of course, um, very digitally savvy, uh, the younger people. And they were trying to encourage, and there was a very low take up of bank accounts. What they actually did is reverse of what most people think. The central bank launched a digital currency to actually encourage mobile wallets that they were issued by them to encourage the young people to then get those mobile wallets to then in turn back into a bank account, which is fascinating if you think about it because originally people thought, well, hold on, if you have a CBDC, you're gonna eliminate the banking system? Like you're gonna get rid of the banks because you don't need them? Actually, you find that in certain countries, it's actually going to reinforce the banking system because um, there's just low take up in certain countries of bank accounts. So that's one example. It's counterintuitive, but, it, but it's playing out. Small country. Excellent. George, would you like to share? Um, I, I have uh, one, two examples. I will stick to, to one. Uh, can we show uh, the other slide? I don't know. Okay, this oh, one. Oh, sorry. This one is a little bit old because uh, provenance has made huge advancements in uh, terms of technology, but the idea is here. So one thing that it is very important is the provenance. I, I, I want to take, uh, let's say, uh, bananas from the supermarket, and I want to know uh, where they're sustainably uh, produced, uh, where did they came from, uh, what was uh, the time, the name of the farmer, and uh, many, many other details. And imagine that uh, I'm not uh, selecting bananas, but I'm uh, selecting meat that came from Argentina. What happened between Argentina and Europe? Did it travel in the correct uh, temperature? And if not, IoT is there, so uh, a smart contract will notice me that the temperature was uh, up two degrees, for example, and I would not uh, accept the deliverance of, of the package. So you see, uh, there are so many implications, and uh, what I, I like to, uh, to say about this technology is that it offers uh, trust. So it's a technology that you can trust. Excellent. I can mention other, but I don't want to... Yes, uh, so as we are heading uh, towards the end of this uh, excellent conversation, uh, just take uh, 30 seconds to to say your opinion regarding if you think that th this technology is going to be a catalyst for the financial world or not. I would say it already is. Okay. Uh, it has pushed the financial service. Think Very about how many world. people now talk about this topic, even if they don't want to. They are forced to. Um, the banks, the big ones, have been forced to actually hire entire teams now to have experts in this space. It is already happening. I think the competitive pressures have now started going full circle. And as I mentioned, like 32% are in live production. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying every division of every company is now working on blockchain, but people have found through their own internal analysis, okay, we're gonna look at this area, we're gonna look at this area, uh, maybe it's cost savings reasons, but actually for other banks, I know they're beginning to look at actually top line, revenue generating opportunities. And that's where people get very excited, right? Uh, new business, <laughs> new money, okay, great. Um, so I think we're gonna see a multi-dimensional world amongst the financial service. It's already happening. It's, the ship has sailed for anyone who thinks this is going away. Sorry. Thank you for this powerful message. George, any last thoughts? I have two very concrete examples. For example, one is uh, very new. Uh, we know that uh, DTCC, uh, Deposit Trust and uh, Clearing Corporation uh, is using uh, R3. It's not blockchain, but it is a uh, distributed ledger technology in order to uh, offer settlement faster. 
And also we have to take a look at uh, the trade finance, which was mentioned earlier. And you can send a letter of credit uh, between a mm. few minutes, uh, let's say. Uh, so yes, uh, it's already changing, like Sandra said, uh, the financial industry. And also, even though it didn't affect them, it, it is pushing them to innovate. Excellent. So I would like to thank you both for this fascinating conversation. It's been an honor to have you both here. Thank you for the acceptance. Thanks, Mariana, for being uh, the linking. Ah, OK. Oh, yes. How can you supplement this? There are a lot of questions. So, Sandra, can you take on the first one? Yeah, um, apart from crypto, okay, sorry. We hear a lot about DLT. Apart from cryptocurrencies, what is the next most successful with high adoption and considerable volumes application of DLT technology? Uh, I would have to say it's uh, the, the settlement side. Uh, how many people are familiar with JP Morgan's link? Uh, their system is running on DLT and it's got what? over 400 institutions involved, and uh, it's the largest intra, can I say intra? <laughs> Financial services uh, settlement platform now. It's doing huge volumes. I don't know what the exact numbers are, but there's an example right there. Excellent. George, would you like to pick another one? Do you see treasurers using DeFi applications in uh, years to come? Okay, this is, um, I, I cannot definitely give a, uh, a correct answer because DeFi is still in progress and uh, I don't know you uh, didn't bring your crystal ball right yes but yes, okay. le let, let me take a, a, a quick guess that um, I don't know if uh, because DeFi is decentralized finance based on uh, maybe commodities maybe in uh, digital assets uh, and I know that uh, treasurers need stability so uh, we need to have to wait to get some, something uh, concrete and maybe regulate it again to, to decide. Excellent point. So Can I make one comment yes, about the DeFi that I think is very confusing? People assume that when people say DeFi, that it means the actual operators are also de decentralized. That is not actually the case for most groups that you're seeing. If you see a layer two or a company or an organization that says they're in DeFi, most likely they're centralized or hybrid centralized. They are not actually DeFi. They're offering decentralized financial services products or services. And that is meant to be the services are actually supposed to be DeFi. And what does that mean? Well, it means that a, they have automated pretty much the entire process of doing a swap or a loan or things that we're very familiar with have just been automated to the point where you literally have just bilateral peer-to-peer -peer transactions going on and it's automatic. Um, the problem right now is the gold rush that has come into DeFi has really distorted uh, some of the basic things that actually I think are very useful to the trading and financial services world. So atomic settlement, instant settlement verification. What does that mean though in a world, in the real world, when you actually need certainty of settlement legally? Those are issues that you know, still need to work out. But I think atomic settlement is, exists, and in DeFi it's a feature, um, it's just built in. So that will be interesting to see if they can get to the place where they gap between real world and Def what goes on in DeFi. Um, uh, automated market making. So anyone who's in the market infrastructure space will know that today we have market makers that actually create liquidity in the markets. That's not automated. It's usually people sitting in front of screens doing it. Um, they might have tools that make it automated, but they, it's not actually automated. Automated market making in DeFi, there are no people. It's machines. That's the difference. Excellent. So thank you both again. It was a pleasure to have you here. I hope the audience really enjoyed it and defog uh, a lot of questions that they had. Thank you very much. Thank you.